Welcome. My name is Michael Bradner. I'm the product manager for Parking and Genetech. And today I'm talking to you about two topics, two evolving topics in parking, curb management and frictionless parking. Well, let's explore our agenda for today's session. Talk about an overview of curb management, examples of curb management, frictionless parking, and mobile AOPR parking. Let's start with the curb management. So today, curb management is a term we probably had heard of a few years ago. We've all experienced uh, elements of the curb in our day-to-day -day lives. So here you'll see a typical street in your average city. You can see there's lots of activity, lots of different uses. What to see what that shows us. So we have bus stops, and that's picking up an average rider, 1,000 riders per day. And all the statistics in this, uh, on this uh, slide will be from the IPM, IPMA report. And the other challenge with that is also there's reserved bus lanes as well as sometimes people parking illegally in, uh, in bus lanes. You have passenger drop-off zones, and those could have to up, up to 100 passengers per day on a road as well as electronic vehicle charging stations. We've also got the traditional meter parking spots we see everywhere and we've all come to know and love. And loading zones. In central business districts, a lot of loading zones, a lot of loading and dropping off for uh, restaurants and stores and tight confined spaces, double parking or deliveries from different services. That's, that's one of the growing pain points for, cut, for cities and administrators to figure out how do we solve these problems. And this represents a lot of economic value to, uh, to cities. So really we have to figure out that's one area we've, we've heard from cities is a big pain point. As the population ages, there's more and more need for power transit and accessible parking zones, either for transportation through bus or smaller vehicles or reserve parking, uh, which represents 90% of the US population. Going back, a couple more items to call out here. On our left, we have um, scooters and microtransit, or the last mile transits we've, we hear so much about. We also have uh, parklets, which take up space. So all of these different uh, uses uh, are, are crowding out the need for space in uh, curb management. So what are the challenges of curb management? As you saw, it's a zero-sum game. Really, there's lots of people competing for that space. And if you gain something, you have to give something else up. So what does that mean? Let's give you an example. We have potentially 15 parking spots on the street. And you've decided that you want one uh, group of spots, five spots you want to use for a, for a parklet, which is a small uh, recreational area or a parking, like a terrace, an outside terrace, uh, to give people more space with some green space. Another, you're going to leave five spots for parking. And then the remaining five spots you'll use for either drop-off zones or a combination of drop-off zones and delivery zones. So those will be flex zones. So we've seen we've taken the same real estate and we broke it up into three different uses. What that means is we've solved some problems, but we've also increased the, the, the charge on parking. And hopefully people's behavior will change because of that. So parking, it's really been the, the primary use for the curb, parking of private vehicles. That's overnight parking, daytime parking, uh, private parking, as in uh, transient parking. They're all different uses for the curb. But that's changing and evolving, as we saw in the prior diagrams. Last mile pickup and micro mobility are really adding a new set of challenges to curb access. Uh, the OECD estimates that last mile pickup and drop offs over the next 10 years in most major cities will result in an increase of 30% of congestion. So that's something we have to take into consideration as. Obviously, with COVID now, people are driving less, but there's a lot more e-commerce drop-offs and pickoffs. So those those double-parked vehicles, uh, they really cause uh, grief, and they're also a safety concern for cities where people can run out and get hit by cars they're not seeing. Something to think about. So who are the customers for the curb? As we said, car parking, uh, primary one. It's been around for many a very long time. It's traditional delivery zones as well as uh, the newer. Uh, pick up and drop off zones for urban e-commerce deliveries. We've got transit hubs and, and passenger and drop off pickup zones. Again, Uber and Lyft weren't around for a long time ago. So people have, um, 
they just run out the guy waits for you or he she waits for you and you jump in the car and they double park off and that causes uh, or they park anywhere they can this is the park stay out of the road taxi stands scooters scooters as we know in some cities they're all over the place they're on the sidewalk they're on the street but they do uh, need proper storage and uh, do docking stations to recharge so those take up or even bikes as well they take up real estate on the curb and there are different users that, that require that access. So what the foundations of curb management? So curb management really is deciding who will use the curb, uh, uh, why they need the curb, when they use the curb, and what rules and or permits they need to use the curb. So those are all how you manage access to the curb. Now, once you determine who can access it when you can, you have to be able to enforce those rules. That's where you try, try to change behavior with hopefully the carrot and sometimes more of the stick. But nevertheless, the goal is to make people comply to make their life easier and, and the rules slightly easier. The operational insights is really about what's going on in the day to day. And intelligent mobility is taking all the data from different points and using it to make good policy decisions. Let's go into the details. So some, some, some trending curb enforcement design options we're seeing in the European market. Uh, traditionally, what you'd see is you'd have a car drive uh, something to the enforcement for whatever reason, either for double park, parked in a handicap zone or bus zone, is you would basically drive by, the officer would drive by, he would see the infraction, he would get out his vehicle, he would double park, which would cause more traffic, he would walk over manually, or key in the handheld, the, handheld the, the information to enforce the citation, and then he or she will drive away. In the interim, that, that data would slowly be uploaded to the system, and you wouldn't really see it right away. What we're seeing a trend is, uh, and also because COVID, people don't want to, agents don't want to be exposed necessarily to, to people, because sometimes, you know, as we, we all know, we get, getting a ticket is never a pleasant experience. So that's one concern. And also there's a lack of efficiency by having people drive around uh, stop, get out, when they can be potentially more efficient, safer, um, and reduce traffic blockups by double parking by having the car or another sensor, could be a light, overhead light, or it could be an in-ground sensor, identify violators, and then have that information screened uh, here centrally, uh, sent to the cloud, screened centrally in a, on a desktop or a laptop or even on a, a tablet, either uh, in the back office or on the street and then if if determining if it's a fraction if it is we can issue citation directly or if we're not sure we might dispatch an agent in the field and they may go back uh, and actually manually uh, validate and issue a citation so really the goal is that their citations are reviewed by a human and not just an automation and then and then we, we have to of course there may be some local considerations maybe bylaws may have to be changed moving away from e-citations and a pathway to centralized enforcement via these citations. So this is really a trend we're seeing in Europe in terms of curb management. We're starting to see it start in the US, but I think it's something we have to consider given the current um, the COVID situation where people, again, for, uh, you know, social distancing is important. And it's definitely an evolving trend we have to take, take note of. Now, as I mentioned, operational insights, visual reporting is going to be more and more important. We really want to see statistics and trends, not in a, to run a traditional you know, um, crystal report with like tables and structure. We want to see it on a map. We want to see it in easily, easy, easy to see visual tools. Now on a map as well, you might want to be able to look at the map. Why? Because you may want to look at patterns on specific streets or maybe specific areas. Is it a signage problem? Is it a, is a, is a parking meter problem? Why is it that in that area, there's a lot of issues with uh, offend, uh, citations being issued? So we want to make sure we have that seeing on a map uh, visually is really worth a thousand words. A picture, as I say, a thousand words. Now, again, we want to see where our officers are on the street, either in a car or walking the beat. And why is that important? Well, there could be a potential uh, issue, like a security issue happening, and you know where they are. You may want to, so you can alert them to avoid certain areas. Either it's a fire, it could be some other protests. So knowing where they are, you could then in real time alert them to avoid certain parts of of the city for various reasons. And then you want to look at also historical data in terms of in terms of checks and citations, again, to, to determine where you may need to do more enforcement in areas, some areas the less. 
Now, it tells you mobility is really around uh, getting in the data from multiple sources. It could be cameras, not just in terms of parking or street use, but it could be also for other systems. And you want to compile it in a single place. And with that data, you want to look at trends in terms of occupancy, in terms of dwell time, in terms of uh, compliance rates, in terms of other, and, and then look at that and say, how do I want to improve that? Or even potentially it's, it's uh, how people are driving through, how much the traffic traffic like, or is there a lot of uh, potentially um, construction projects, either residential or road work that's impacting uh, mobility in that area? And really, you, may, you might need to, in some cases, extract that data out and use a different uh, analytical tools to make decisions. But really, the goal is to have the data at your hand, reliable data to make good decisions and, and make good policy decisions. Because the goal is to improve mobility, reduce congestion, uh, pollution, um, and we're seeing that too again with with the COVID situation where people are, are are turning roads into bike lanes. We'll see if that's a permanent uh, change, which will definitely change parking because if more streets are closed off as less parking, we'll see how that changes into parking, uh, transportation, and things like that in the future. So the curb. We've also got different things to think about. We've got regulations. These have to be addressed, assessed, and, and adjusted based on the policies you, you put in place. Signage, um, you may need to look at, uh, again, as I said earlier, there may be signage which is not clear or needs to be updated. Or if you're using flex zones, where in the daytime, it's a, it's maybe that, that those three spots are allocated for Lyft or Uber Eats to pick up and drop off. And the evening, there are for delivery zones. You may want to look at the dynamic signage for those. And then uh, fixtures, the bus lanes, shelters, scooter corrals, all those need to be assessed, inventoried, and then make sure they're, uh, they're current, things are working properly. And then having inventory of all this information, the base stations and, and the parklets may, uh, may come down in the winter for some cities, it may stay year round. And then also enforcing sidewalk, park, sidewalk uh, cafe permits. You may have issued a sidewalk park, uh, park uh, sidewalk cafe permit that you may have to potentially, if someone violates certain rules, their cafe is bigger, you may have to again assess those and, and make certain uh, adjustments. Let's go to a common example, a most recent example of, um, of curb management using technology to improve access as well as, as congestion and traffic flow. So it's kind of funny that you think about it when we were kids. Our parents told us not to get in the car with strangers and not to talk to strangers. And now we're using our phone to call a stranger to come pick us up. That's one way to look at technology. And it's, it's, it definitely made it easier than calling up a taxi and waiting, not knowing where they are. But there's also the challenges. Neither you know the, neither, neither the Uber driver know who they're picking up or where they're picking up. So at a recent uh, trade show at San Diego Airport, uh, well, the trade wasn't at the airport, but we, the pickup zone was at the airport. You enter the line, and typically, if you had an Uber at, at most airports, you would have to just, you know, there's a, a designated pickup and drop-off zone. You, you know, you, you, you request a drive. He picks you up. You look for his car. He looks for you. You try to figure it out. And sometimes he may miss you, or in the wrong zones happens to me. They drive around, and then use another 15 minutes. So what is this? What do they do in the San Diego airport? They, when you request a ride, you're given a six-digit code, and the, ride, and the driver also gets that six-digit code. So he knows so he knows who he's picking up. Now, the curbside manager at the curb at the airport uh, has specific spots he puts you in, like you would for a taxi, you know, section A1, section B1, section B3, and then the driver goes using your code. He matches you, and he picks you up at the correct spot. So what does that do? For the driver, he's not driving around, causing congestion, wasting energy uh, in terms of fuel, gas, and you're not losing time waiting for a pickup. So really, it's a more efficient way to address uh, pickup and drops off at airports. That's a sample. That's an, and that's been really well received at the San Diego airport. I'm sure other cities and airports will look at doing this for high pickup and turnover zones. So let's move into frictionless parking. Really, this is more about off-street parking. Curb management is more, to, what I would say, is more on-street parking. This is more looking at off-street parking. So before we get into automated, uh, using uh, LPR to look at the workflow, I think we're seeing another trend evolving here where people 
Um, you know, if you're going into a parking lot, you'd have to press the button to get your ticket, the gate opens, you go down, the gate breaks, you can't get in, or if the gate's offline, or if they're out of paper, they can't put tickets. And then is the whole, again, back to the whole COVID-19 situation where I have to physically press a button that's been pressed by, you know, many people before me, and there's no way they can clean the button after every time someone uses the button to open the gate. So the idea here is to go to frictionless or gateless or contactless parking. So how does ALPR help with that? So instead of having a gate, um, we would have two cameras, an in and out camera. The camera has its, its zone where it's reading the plates. Car drives by, LPR camera reads the plate. There you go. Converts it and stores it. And then we calculate uh, when they've arrived. And we know the car, we have a picture of the car as well. So basically I know when they're coming in, I know. So that gives us, that gives us um, visibility uh, and situational awareness of who's on site in my garage and when. So I can determine a couple of things in that my occupancy level, how long they stay in my lot, as well as, um, so the dwell time, as well as uh, calculating how much they need to pay me. So, um, and I have their information. So if they try to leave without paying, we can always put a gate maybe at the exit point. Now then, again, I could, applying this to, to a campus, be it a commercial campus or a university campus or even a medical campus, I can use this information to know where people are and if a crime was committed in a specific part of the facility, I can know what cars were there, and by that know who, which drivers in theory should be there, unless of course a car is stolen, and it gives me information on potentially narrow down suspects for a crime, as well as um, the patterns of people coming in, in and out of the of a facility. So I have forensic analysis information, I have their occurrences, when they come, how often they come, all information comes in from the camera. So what are the, where would I use fixed ALPR in terms of helping with frictionless parking? Well, we wouldn't want to use surface lots that have that are totally open. So for example, a shopping center, or there's or it's an open area or a strip mall. But we would want to use it where we have more controlled access to the facility through um, limited uh, in and outs or egress. Now, uh, and or garages where we have maybe one or two exit points. Now, one thing we've noticed uh, again, uh, a trend in co with COVID-19, is that um, obviously there's there's recreational areas, there's parks, and there's uh, beaches that you can't control people who come in that walk in or bike in, but administrators can control the number of cars that access the facility. So they might want to look at typically, for example, on a beach or or in a park. They may limit it to a thousand cars, which maybe has an average two cars, two or three people per car. But they can control how many cars access that facility. So they may say to minimize, you know, the impact on social distancing and having to police the, the beach or the facility, I may limit for the temporarily to 500 cars. So what we can use as the ALPR to determine not who they are as much or if they have a valid permit, but how many people are coming in and when they're coming in and trends. So I can determine, do I close my barrier off, uh, not to allow them in using that as a tool for occupancy. There's also, of course, access control as a tool, but we're here we're looking at in this trend, we're seeing more is around limiting access to control uh, people on the site and as well as limiting uh, potential social distancing, social distancing concerns for, uh, for administration. So here's an example in a traditional parking lot now, as I said earlier, today a lot of places have parks and they have a gate and you press the button and you get your ticket and you go in. What we're talking about primarily is the vehicle drives up to the gateless entry point, drives through the gate, the vehicle captures captures the plate. But what, based on the time, we calculate a convenience time. What does that mean? I allow them time to purchase their parking. So a lot of, a lot of people may buy it at a station. They may pay for it on their phone. Or they may have an app that allows them to have an ongoing budget or a reserve amount of money that they that they pull down as they park or off. So once they've paid, or prepaid in this case, if you will, we would say they're allowed two hours. So they do their shopping or they do their whatever they need to do with the doctor, whatever it is. And then when that time expires, we, we give them a, a slight grace period. So that's to pay again 
uh, or to, to leave the facility if it's a multi-level facility before we consider them in violation. Once the violation period ends, then we would issue them, then we potentially have a violation. We would dispatch a mobile vehicle potentially or someone on foot to uh, identify those vehicles and ticket them. Now, another trend we're seeing, so that, now if they do leave the facility, of course, we know we don't issue the ticket, but, uh, but the other thing we're also seeing is, as I said earlier, people don't want to, they want the frictionless or contactless parking, and they want to pay uh, when they leave because they may not know how long they're going to stay. So post-payment is also becoming, again, another concept of, of parking or frictionless parking that's coming about where people want to drive in, park their car, do their business, uh, then pay on their app when they're about to leave or pay on the pay station with their plate and that, that allows us to calculate, again, duration, time, and, and, and effective rates. So another trend we're seeing in, in terms of, again, minimal touch points in terms of parking, making the customer experience as easy as possible. So what are these, what are we learning from these, these new uh, approaches? So again, one thing that it's real time, which we don't necessarily have if we press the button and get the ticket, we have that real-time data. We obviously we could get occupancy in either situation, but really know where where we have a lot more real-time data on on the people and the places they're staying. We get notifications. So if I'm a, a sports facility and I want to know when certain people come in, or or um, I make a notification, or if a delivery truck comes, I can get a notification via text or email. So I really know. Um, by plate, and I can trigger certain behaviors to happen and notification alerts. And then I can analyze my turnover, how long they stay, and then how long they come back. And why would I want to do that? Potentially, I may charge, um, instead of charging individual, if it's a commercial lot, I may charge on the number of times they come per month in that facility. So here's a concept around, again, further expanding on the frictionless concept is um, multi-tenant. Multi so a shared facility which has uh, multiple user types and each user type has their own permit. I can look at the occupancy for the entire parking uh, garage. I can see how many people are having violation. I can see um, how each tenant is using their permit. So for instance, I have uh, my park and play, I have my holding company, I have my hotel, and we all share the same facility. You've always seen this at conventions and we're parking shared of, amongst multiple uh, tenants. And I wanna, I wanna allocate and break those out so I can show um, how this usage, is, how it's being used, and potentially reallocate spots. If one tenant is only using half their spots on an average over a six month period or trend, I may wanna allocate, reallocate some of their spots for transit parking or daytime parking. That gives me more money and, uh, and, and a more efficient use of my, my real estate. Then I also look at the trends because there may be busier times in the day that, uh, that are coming in. And then, so that would give me you know, what are my touch points are when people come in when they leave. Uh, and that's something good information to, to plan for. I might even want to have some sometimes or busy, busy events. I might want to have a gate attendant available if people have questions or get stuck. But the idea again is to pay by plate. And these people here all have their permits and then people don't have permits or unassigned vehicles, and those are the ones that are the transit partners. A bit of an extension of what we talked about earlier around um, uh, central enforcement, this is how do we use, uh, what's the workflow of validating uh, license plates, either on a fixed camera or a mobile camera? So what do we do with that? How does that all work? So the, automatic cam the camera will automatically read uh, the license plate. There's no need to trigger, press a button as I drive by, or the camera in the in the in the gate, in the entrance point. I capture multiple pictures. I can either stitch them together, and the system will then compare and provide the best results and the best reads. So I'm going to compare those plates against the list that I maintain for my employees, for my contractors or suppliers, people who do or delivery people and visit them. So an example might be a, a hospital where I want to track how many uh, doctors, nurses, general personnel and visitors come in and allocate spots to them. And I might, I might want to shut off potentially um, access to certain visitor types or, or, or permit types if I, if I achieve their maximum availability. And I may keep, want to keep people out, so on hot lists, 
if there's a vehicle which has been uh, has, has has caused problems or was not paid previously, or a former employee that you know we don't want any people you know uh, coming to the facility who might want to seek uh, certain certain retributions, whatever they might want to do, we want to keep them out of the facility. And unmatched cars, of course, would be transient partners. So then I have that information on React. I get instant notifications, so I can color code those based on severity or urgency, and then I get those notifications. It's really the workflow is helping you <clears throat> understand the data. So I'm going to record all that data based on you know the, the, the plate and the key where they where they came in, direction of the vehicle, state of the vehicle, what what operation or what was done by the operator based on that vehicle. And then I can use that data to, to pull with other systems within a, a security center type environment. So I may mirror that with video surveillance, or I may use um, voice over IP, um, uh, two-way radios, if I have to talk to people who have issues, accessing the parking, getting other parking, paying their parking, as well as controlling access to certain doors based on when they arrive. So uh, a series of events can be triggered based on the license plate, so it can be more than just entering the garage and paying for parking, it also can be used as an access uh, control tool. So this is per permit enforcement. So this is mobile, I'm driving on the street with my vehicle. Again, like I said earlier, the idea is not in the central model and all there we maybe do all the logic in the back of the house or in the, in the central piece, but we also may do some of it on edge processing. So uh, as you're driving the vehicle, you're gonna drive by you're going to check if they have a permit. The system will give you a notification if you're on edge processing, that you have an or edge on enforcement, that you have an actual uh, positive. In this case, they're good. They have a permit. I go to the next car. I validate, and oh, they don't have a permit. So in this case, if I'm doing edge enforcement, I would issue a permit. I would I would issue a citation on the spot. <clears throat> if I'm doing central enforcement, I would drive by, and that. The, the system would calculate that they don't have a permit and based on the data from the cameras, either the LPR and context cameras, I would issue a citation directly or I may decide <clears throat> to send someone back with a PD extension or I may even dispatch it back to the officer driving the car and may go cycle back um, later in the day or, or a different point in time. So what have we learned about how do I use mobile ALPR, what are the uses for it in terms of uh, frictionless parking? So we have the, the traditional garages, we have the surface lots, as in similar to standard uh, fixed cameras. We have roadway parking, which we just saw our example of. And, and, and as you grow out of roadway parking, you may have specific areas, like I said, that you enforce in terms of beaches or recreational areas or parks, which are outside of parks being a, as in a recreational park, not as, as in park software. And again, really real time, the trends, the data, and notification of violations so you can go and enforce if needed as soon as possible. And really the goal, of course, is, is as part of the communities to help uh, uh, customers to potentially also find parking, right? Once we know where there's availability, it's it's smart parking to navigate to those spots. So all these are all these are possible uses and applications of using ALPR. Uh, mobile APR and fixed APR in parking. So to recap, what have you seen today? So really, from a curb managed perspective, um, it's around using the data to make real-time decisions to adjust the market conditions. So it could be also adjusting parking rates based on demand, as one instance we've seen, and that's also growing. Around mobility, so using data to make policy decisions to really look at the usage of the curb and the needs of the users and how to balance that out to be most efficient, reduce congestion, and of course, increase safety for citizens and pedestrians. And then lastly, the security of the actual officers. So again, with COVID-19, people don't necessarily want to be uh, enforcing on the street, touching cars, checking plates. Checking plates on a, on a camera is obviously not a problem, but the proximity to people on the street might be concern for some people. So that's that's why, uh, again, the central model is another um, way to address these type of concerns. 
So, in a nutshell, that's that's our talk today about curbside management, uh, the evolving trend in, in, in on-street parking, as well as um, frictionless parking, the trend in off-street parking. So, I hope that I was thoughtful. It was a useful talk today, and you've learned some new concepts and theories. Thank you for your time, and enjoy the rest of the show.